I want to say a couple of things about what Nima just expressed. One is that I've come to realize that around the world, feminists do differ with one another on this issue. Um, in the United States, for example, the National Organization for Women uh, came out with a statement uh, two, three years ago uh, denouncing honor-based violence. And what was so delicious, so rich about uh, how they did this is that they had an African-American Democratic politician, a member of Congress, who represented the state of Texas, who came to the microphone and said, we know that we'll be called racists for saying what we've just said. But if you want to know racism, I, as an African-American woman living in Texas, I'll talk to you about racism. And she said, dare to t tell me I'm a racist. And it was so well thought out, the, the point that they were making, that um, there are certain causes of types of violence. And in this case, the uh, source of violence against the women they were talking about, mostly but not exclusively, Muslim women, very much is the tribal custom. Not Islamic custom, which we'll get into if you want, but the tribal custom. In the south. Well, hold on one second. Right out of uh, the peninsula, of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. But as I was thinking about all of this, I came to realize that there's a very interesting way of explaining this point to, um, to non-Muslims who, and frankly to Muslims, who will be uncomfortable with identifying group honor as a source of violence. And that brings me to my second point. And it's very much uh, explained in Allah, Liberty, and Love, which is this. Most people don't realize, but when you say it to them, it, the light bulb goes off, that in the United States, in the Deep South, what propped up slavery was the culture of honor, and specifically group honor or family honor. 200 years ago, 150 years ago, at the height of slavery in the United States, an entire apparatus of oppression, both of African Americans and of women, was maintained by declaring and treating the white man as the head of the household, and for blacks and whites, and for blacks and women, to be intermingling with one another would have brought disgrace upon the honor of that man and therefore upon his entire family. On the slave owner. That the is. slave owner, exactly. Okay. Now, think about this. Um, today, if you were to encounter a racial segregationist, a white person who refuses to shake the hand uh, of a black person because to do so would be to pollute his honor as a white man, I think that even despite the politeness and the famous reserve of Sweden, I think most of you would want to say something and would probably say something, not rudely, I'm sure, but, but maybe, and you'll, you'll at least make a comment about it, I, I would hope and I would think. Um, what would you do if you also encountered then a Muslim man who will not shake the hand of a woman because to do so would be to bring disgrace and dishonor upon him. Okay. There is a direct parallel here. And in my own country of Canada, though I teach and live now in New York City, I remain a Canadian citizen, in my own country of Canada from which I've just come, I was told and the story is very big now, that even in a cosmopolitan city like Toronto, you know, prayer rooms are now being reserved for uh, Muslims uh, in which girls and boys in public schools are being not just separated, segregated, okay? And women, girls, are instructed to sit behind the boys, of course, girls who are on their period, who are menstruating, are considered so dirty, okay, for this natural process, that they are instructed to sit at the very back of the room. It's not simply a matter then of 
making, being, be, you know, tackling an uncomfortable issue. Racism is uncomfortable, yet it seems to me that much of the West has gotten to the point where uh, we're more than comfortable addressing this and denouncing this. What will it take, Nima, to get to the point where we understand the parallel between racial segregation 200 years ago in the culture of group honor that plagued the deep south of the United States and the culture of group honor that not just keeps men and women segregated in Islam today, but as Sarah has done such an important uh, job of pointing out repeatedly, leads to actual violence in the name of Islam. You know, I know this from very, very private and personal conversations with progressives around the world, that they worry about being perceived as racist, as bigot, as Islamophobes, and notice, by the way, that their honor is what they're worried about. How selfish. Yeah. Yeah. How utterly narcissistic. Um, at a time in which globalization uh, increasingly blurs the lines of how people think of themselves, uh, I'm not one thing and I'm not another, the insecurity brought on uh, by blurred lines, and also these days by, again, the cratering global economy, um, convinces a lot of people to dig in their heels and become even more narrow in their identities. And when that happens, uh, emotions rise, um, the emotional walls go up, and it's very easy, and I would suggest to you, therefore very lazy, to define yourself as what you are not, rather than all that you are. Now the reason I bring this up is that there are games being played by Muslims who define themselves as moderates and as community leaders, in which they will make somebody like this feminist woman believe that she, that is, she is racist, okay? Because she's pointing out something that is obvious and needs to be addressed. But what she doesn't do, uh, and again, uh, you know, her emotions are at play here as well, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to be perceived um, as something other than noble. Um, what she doesn't do, maybe because she's not aware, is she doesn't call out those games. She doesn't say, and many progressives don't say, wait a minute, I know what's going on here. Uh, this is a political ploy, okay? You're th throwing around these labels like racist and Islamophobe and, and bigot. This is a political ploy to shut down discussion before it even begins. And I'm going to call you on it, and I'm going to compel you to address this point rather than capitulating to how you insist on framing the issue. I've heard only Sarah say this lots of times. How do we go beyond this fear of some, of some people? Well, isn't that the big question of the night? And it's, it's seriously, I mean, it's, it's, there's no bullet point, or for that matter, bulletproof answer to that question, but this is exactly what the new book is devoted to. I'll try to get more specific in just a second, but for some background for the audience, I mentioned that I now live and teach in New York City, at New York University specifically. And what I, um, what I lead there is something called the Moral Courage Project. Now, moral courage, as Robert F. Kennedy defined it, is the willingness to speak truth to power within your own community for a greater good, such as universal human rights. But why within your own community? Why not just throw open the window and yell to the world, you know, we need to change? He pointed out that's not enough. It has to be, or ought to be, within your community as you define it. Why? Because this is where the most painful backlash will come from. Um, when you indict outsiders for, you know, their uh, uh, crimes against your community, such as U.S. foreign policy, Israel, as you know, we Muslims love to, to do the finger pointing, um, fine. But you know that whatever criticism comes from outsiders, you can wear that as a badge of tribal honor. To go back to your community and say, look, look at what I'm doing to stand up for us against them. I know where I belong. But the moment 
you challenge abuse of power within your community, that is when the security blanket of instant belonging disappears. Now what? And this is the great, one of the great questions then, you know, it, particularly again in an era of raging identity politics, is how do individuals develop moral courage? Not just within Islam, but outside of it as well. If you think about progressives, for example, how does, again, this feminist, you know, uh, 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 leader, so-called leader, um, develop the moral courage yeah. to stand up to the perception and even the accusation, as most assuredly it will be, that she is a racist. Yeah. Okay. There are, in the new book, um, seven key lessons, and each one is a chapter, seven key lessons that I've learned um, in my own journey over the last 10 years about developing moral courage. Mm. There are many more lessons to be learned, don't get me wrong, this is not a seven step program, okay? Uh, I wish it were that simple. But the point is that uh, all kinds of lessons, as you undergo the journey to develop moral courage, all kinds of lessons will be picked up by you in, uh, in conversation with other people. You come to see that there are certain patterns of fear that people succumb to. And so, for example, the very first um, chapter of the book, um, which is the first lesson of moral courage, is that some things are more important than fear. Now, what I mean by this is that, you know, moral courage doesn't require any of us to be fearless. We're human. We're always going to fear something. Let's not set the bar so high that we cease to be human along the way. Because number one, that's dishonest. And number two, it's unsustainable anyway. Okay? So if you recognize that you're always going to have fears, but then you can work with those fears to transcend them yeah. in order to speak up about that which matters. Uh, that is, again, a key to recognizing that, wait a minute, I really am you know, capable of this. I really am uh, better than I give myself credit for. 